I, I felt like I was dying. It was, it was horrible. A husband cries out to God for his dying wife. I opened my heart to him and I told him, if you could, uh, if you could save Jackie, if you could hear this prayer of mine. Plus, he was the king of cool and America's number one movie star. Now see a side of Steve McQueen that you didn't see in his films. Steve McQueen realized he needed Christ. So the king of cool met the king of kings. On today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. A student at Berkeley recently asked conservative commentator Ben Shapiro if first trimester fetuses have moral value. His response got a rousing ovation and has now been viewed by almost five million times on Facebook. Here's that exchange. So um, my question was about abortion, and I just wanted to know why exactly do you think a first trimester fetus has moral value? Okay, so a first trimester fetus has moral value because whether you consider it a potential human life or, an, or a full-on human life, it has more value than just a cluster of cells. If left to its natural processes, it will grow into a baby. So the real question is, where do you draw the line? So you can draw the line at the heartbeat, because it's very hard to draw the line at the heartbeat. There are people who are adults who are alive because of a pacemaker, and they need some sort of outside force generating their heartbeat. Okay, are you gonna do it based on brain function? Okay, well, what about people who are in a coma? Should we just kill them? Right, the problem is, anytime you draw any line other than the inception of the child, you end up drawing a false line that can also be applied to people who are adults. So either human life has intrinsic value or it doesn't. I think we both agree that adult human life has intrinsic value. Can we start from that premise? I believe that sentience um, has, is what gives something moral value, not, okay, necessarily, so, not necessarily being a human alone. Okay, because, so, or, when you're, so when you're asleep, can I stab you? I'm still considered sentient when I'm asleep. Okay, if you are in a coma from which you may awake, can I stab you? Well then, uh, no. Yes, no, I mean, like, well, I'm glad you answered that because I have no interest in actually murdering that's, you. But that's, so, but that's still potential sentience and it's still a potential... Like, I agree, like, it is potential sentience. sentience. You know what okay. else is potential sentience? Being right. a fetus. The, the issue with that... Uh, the issue I have with that, though, is that um, in, if, if I'm in a coma and I'm not like doing anything to anyone, I'm not causing any issues amongst the world, whereas a, a, an un... An unwanted child may or may not be a burden to people. Okay, well, there are lots of people who are unwanted, right? I mean, there are lots of people's parents who are unwanted, right? We're a bunch of college students. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the problem is that now, so now you're shifting the argument, right? Before you were making the argument based on the intrinsic value of a life based on sentience, and now you're talking about the level of burden that somebody presents as a separate moral argument, okay? I don't believe that you being a burden on somebody is justification for them killing you, as a general rule. I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I appreciate you, and thank you. No, thanks. <laughs> well, ben, ben Shapiro's appearance at Berkeley it brought out so many angry protesters that the university, university spent, believe this, $600,000 on security. Well, that same week, over 1,000 pro-life young people gathered outside an abortion clinic in Charlotte, North Carolina. There was no violence, no destruction of property, and no significant cost for security. Instead, these students protested in a unique way. Take a look. Young people are not the only ones taking a stand. On Monday, October 9, an army of women will descend on Washington, D.C. They believe it's their time to rise up, and here's why. I believe the collective cry of a million mothers around the world is going to birth a movement that is greater than anything we have ever seen believe that there's a march of Deborah coming forth. That's the march of righteousness and purity and it's fearless. We have been prepared for the last years for such a time as now. And the heart, why? Why me? Why do I believe in this? It's because we do have to stand up for this generation. We can rise above. 
what our culture is telling us a woman has to be in this hour. This is our time. This is our hour. And there may never be a time like this. This is the time for the women and girls of America and around the world to wake up and rise up. So we're calling an army of young generation Esthers and Deborahs to rise right now. So that they can stand in who they are and have the foundation of knowing God. You don't have to settle for a generation in our nation being destroyed by deception. It's time for the woman to step out of the shadows of insecurity and fears and shame. Be who God created you to be and set your world on fire. It's time for the women preachers to arise. It's time for the women voices to arise. It's time for the real thing. It's time for the outpouring of Acts chapter two. It's why I believe in this, this call to women to rise up as mothers of a nation, mothers in your family. And if you'll come and if you'll cry together, God is gonna birth it. I am Deborah. I am. Deborah. I am Esther. I am Esther. I am Deborah. I am Esther. For my sons and daughters. For my sons and daughters. Sons and daughters. I will rise up. I will rise up. I will rise up. I will rise up. For my sons and daughters. Beginning today and on October 9th, we will rise up. Well, if you want to be a part of it, there's still time to make your plans to be there. Rise Up is happening Monday, October 9th at the Mall in Washington, D.C., and you can find out more by going to riseup2017.org. Well, Hillsong United is on a new tour they're calling Wonder in the Wild. This tour has been a little different. The group has been worshiping with the sick and those in prison. Watch how they were received at the Tennessee Penitentiary for Women. There's days the only thing I have is God's grace that gets me up because no matter how strong or how resilient you are, it gets tough here. And there's some days that's all we have to stand on. It's just the music and the, and the words and the lyrics because we don't have family. We don't have loved ones in here. Or to think about the people that we've hurt or the choices that we've made. You know, that's tough to live with sometimes. But the music reminds us that God loves us unconditionally. It's going on a year. August will be a year here in Henning. My role as a chaplain is to help with their spiritual walk. They all have been through something, but it's all been different. They're all on a different journey. They come to want to be a part of the family of Jesus. It has to be with something that they want to do. And it's hard for them to get there because of their life and where they come from. It, it was hard for people to understand, are you sure it's Hillsong United? Because they, it, they never dreamed that something like this would ever happen. And to happen at WTRC, it's awesome. Today we have the privilege of being in the West Tennessee State Penitentiary. They have 800 women inmates. They're coming in later for, for a worship night. So this is not even chapel, it's not a service. It's totally voluntary. So we're really excited, looking forward to it. The guys are setting up now, so it's gonna be great. I'm just, I'm thrilled that this group is coming. I can't tell you how many ladies are jumping up and down waiting for this. I'm one of them. I just can't wait for tonight to happen because this is something that we would have never expected, never thought about, or even dreamed of, especially being in here. Why don't you stand your feet with us? Well, um, we're about to have church in this place on a Tuesday night. Are you up for that? We are so excited to be here. We're a band called Hillsong United. We come from a church in Sydney, Australia, and we're believing the next hour that we have together, we're going to have fun, we're going to sing, and God's going to move. So if you believe it, come on, would you put your hands together?
just being able to just praise God and listen to this music and lose yourself in it. And, you know, I don't think they really understand how their words touch us. That is wonderful. And Hillsong's United latest release is also called Wonder, and it's available wherever music is sold. Well, coming up, Steve McQueen was a movie star, a fashion icon, and a race car driver. Still, there was one thing the king of cool really wanted to have done. One thing Steve said before he died was, my only regret in life is that I was not able to tell people about what Christ did for me. Pastor Greg Laurie reveals the hidden side of Steve McQueen. That's up next. Well, nearly 40 years after his death, movie star Steve McQueen is still called the King of Cool. His rags to riches life story and it still fascinates us, but few people know about one very important chapter of that story. Ephraim Graham has this look at his journey to faith. He ain't gonna put out 194 bucks in a lousy pair. You did. Movies, motorcycles, and model-like style paint a pretty picture of Steve McQueen. But the King of Cool overcame a lot to become the Hollywood boy wonder of the 60s and 70s. He had no father and his mother really did not raise him. Alcoholic. She was a raging alcoholic with a lot of guys. And, and I tracked with that part of the story because I too had an alcoholic mother, married and divorced seven times, and I never knew my biological father. Only the gospel can change a human heart. In addition to leading California's Harvest Christian Fellowship Church, Greg Laurie is quite the Steve McQueen fan. Maybe I should first state that I have a bullet Mustang. And if people, you know what that is, yeah, I right? Do, I do. Well, for those people that don't know what that is, there was a film that McQueen made a number of years ago in the 60s called Bullet. And he plays a detective named Frank Bullet. And he drives this uh, green 1968 Mustang. Pretty much the greatest cinematic car chase in history was in that film. So I have a replica of that car. So I bought that car. My wife wasn't that thrilled <laughs> with this idea. Steve McQueen's resume by Hollywood standards today could be considered relatively short, but he is an American icon. Why do you think we're so fascinated with him? Yeah, I don't know the answer. Um, not everybody from his generation is an icon, but James Dean, another contemporary of McQueen, is an icon. Elvis is an icon. The Beatles are iconic. Certain people transcend time and they become iconic characters. Uh, I think maybe one of the things that makes a person an icon is when there's sort of a timelessness about them. In other words, when new generations can discover them. I actually read this article in a men's fashion magazine, and you're a very fashionable guy, by the way, <laughs> Ephraim. But, um, and it asked the question, who was cooler, Steve McQueen or James Dean? And they were examining their life uh, on the basis of the cool cars they drove. And they both drove cool cars, uh, the movies they made, and kind of their fashion sense. And the conclusion was McQueen was cooler than Dean. Well, I don't know about taking any more orders, but I'd sure like to get up on the pulpit, sound off with all those sergeants out in the congregation. <laughs> I'd sure give them hellfire and brimstone. Beyond his style points and his car, there's an even bigger McQueen story Lori spent time chasing. I started delving into Steve's life more, and I'd heard that he'd become a Christian, and I believed it to be true, but I never had checked it out. Well, I'd seen a documentary film last year, and it talked about his rise from, you know, the worst childhood imaginable to superstardom, where he was the number one movie star in the world in films like Bullet, The Great Escape, The Magnificent Seven, The Thomas Crown Affair, etc. And then how he walked away from Hollywood and became a Christian. I thought, well, is this true? So I started with a Google search, and I started reading old articles, and the name popped up, Leonard DeWitt. Leonard was the pastor uh, who led Steve to Christ. And I thought, well, I wonder if this guy's alive still. So we tracked him down and I said, are you the Leonard DeWitt that prayed with Steve McQueen? And he said, yes, I am. I was amazed that Leonard didn't have like a website, the preacher who <laughs> led McQueen to Christ. I mean, I that's kind of an accomplishment. Yeah. Laurie shares the details of the meeting between DeWitt and McQueen in his book, The Salvation of an American Icon. One of the surprises for me in reading the book was the Billy Graham connection. Yeah. 
Was that a surprise to you? No, I knew that story, but I didn't know the details of it. I did ask Billy about this years ago. He, of course, confirmed the story was true. The story? Doctors diagnosed McQueen with an aggressive cancer mere months after he accepted Christ. Before he flew to Mexico for surgery, he met Billy Graham, and Graham gave McQueen his Bible. Steve went down, had the surgery done. After they wheeled him into recovery, he was waiting in this room alone at a clinic in Juarez, Mexico, and he died, and he went into the presence of God. They came in to find Steve, and they pulled the sheet back, and he was holding on to that Bible. It was indeed Billy Graham's Bible he was holding on to, maybe reading it before the Lord called him home. And one thing Steve said before he died was, my only regret in life is that I was not able to tell people about what Christ did for me. So I wrote a book that's out now, and I'm doing this documentary film because I wanted to write that wrong. I think that is a story worth telling. And to me, the takeaway truth of it for people watching us right now is there's no one who's beyond the reach of God. You might say, well, I know someone, they would never come to Jesus. What about Steve McQueen? Steve McQueen, Mr. Cool, the King of Cool, realized he needed Christ. So the King of Cool met the King of Kings. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Phoenix, Arizona. Well, the new documentary film, Steve McQueen, American Icon, it's in select theaters for one night only. It's coming up this Thursday, September 28th. And by the way, at the end of the film, Pastor Greg Laurie presents the gospel. So bring a friend with you. And to find a theater near you, all you have to do is go to stevemcqueenmovie.com. Coming up, an emergency C-section goes all wrong. It was the most painful thing I've ever went through. And so I, I did, I, I felt like I was dying. It was, it was horrible. I can feel every single thing. I could feel the, the doctor's hands. See how this mom's life and the life of her baby were saved after this. Jackie Dawson had already endured 20 hours of labor when her doctor ordered an emergency C-section. But the pain medication had not kicked in, and Jackie could feel every aspect of the surgery. So while she cried out for mercy, her husband stormed heaven with prayer. July 6, 2016 was an exciting day for Jackie and Gabriel Wilford. That afternoon, Jackie went into labor with their first child. Prayed my whole life, you know, I want a son, I want someone that I can raise up to be a servant for you, God. Jackie had been in labor 20 hours when they learned the baby developed an infection with mother and child in danger her doctor ordered an emergency C-section. I don't think it set in. The reality of a C-section and the complications, they could both die if they don't do this procedure. So when it really hit me is when I actually saw her on the table. That's when it actually, I'm like, okay, this is, this is something real. This is a serious thing. They started the surgery, but the pain blockers hadn't taken effect. It was the most painful thing I've ever went through. And so, I, I did, I, I felt like I was dying. It was, it was horrible. I can feel every single thing. I could feel the, the doctor's hands press on my stomach and then the, it was just really painful. <laughs> the doctor delivered a healthy baby boy, but by then, Jackie had gone into shock. I kept sh uncontrollably shaking and I could, I had to keep my hands to my like body because I felt like my body was just shutting down. I couldn't. I couldn't speak at one point. I knew it was serious, but I didn't want to let my mind start to, to think about it. And then, you know, if I'm panicking, well, then there's no way that I can be there for my kid or my wife. Gabriel texted family in the waiting area to pray for Jackie. I remember the doctor saying, okay, well, we're gonna put you to sleep right now. And then at that time I was like praying like, Lord, please, 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 like help me, help my son and make sure we come out healthy. The doctor stabilized Jackie and moved her to a recovery room. Gabriel thought the danger was past. It was, it was a sigh of relief. I was like, okay, Jackie's in the recovery room. She's holding the baby. She's a little woozy, but that's okay. It all went south when the doctor walked over to her and, you know, he pulled up her, the, the blankets that were on her. It was a, 
so much blood that just came out. It just came pouring out. I was really scared. I was scared of what I saw. I saw in his eyes a little bit of fear, and I did. I became fearful. Jackie passed out, and the doctor called a code blue. Gabriel and Baby Dawson were rushed from the room as the Code Blue team went to work. I just wanted somebody to come and grab me <laughs> and tell me it's going to be OK. I was preparing myself for the worst. I did not want to be a single dad. Jackie is so fun, and she's my best friend. So it would be like losing you know, a part of me and things like that. Alone in the hall, Gabriel cried out to God. I opened my heart to him, and I told him if he could uh, if he could save Jackie, if he could hear this prayer of mine, he had spoke to me right away. Gabriel says God assured him that he was in control and that Jackie would be fine. I cried out to him and he was right there. You know, before I even cried out to him, he was, he was right there, I just didn't see it. You know, God had taken my burden, taken those woes and no matter what happened, I knew, hey, it's gonna be okay. You don't have to worry about anything at all. A few minutes later, they told Gabriel his wife had pulled through and was resting. He recalls the relief as he walked into her room. I just started joking around with her, how we, you know, I was like, you know, you almost died on me. I remember thinking all those things, you know, we could joke so much. Um, I said, she's my best friend. Over the next couple of days, Gabriel opened up in a Facebook post about his love for Jackie and the miraculous answer to prayer. I couldn't let her know how scared I was. I wanted to say I love you and tell her everything's gonna be okay. I watched helplessly as they tried to save my wife. I wanted to cry out to God and ask him why. God spoke to me. Gabriel, my son, I love you more than you can imagine. It's okay to call on me. I will always love you. Dawson was given a round of antibiotics to clear up his infection. A few days later, he and Jackie were released from the hospital. Both Jackie and Gabriel believe that prayer saved her life that day. I really believe that God heard our prayers, that maybe it was time for me to go. Maybe, maybe my time here on earth was done, like there was no more for me. And God heard someone's voice saying that I have a purpose, like I have a reason to be here. God answered prayers because I, I do, I, I really thought I was dying. A lot of people, I don't, I don't think they, they understand the power of prayer. It's your one connection to God that he actually hears your voice, the, the uh, maker of the world. You know, they can actually hear you. Prayer is power, no matter in what circumstance, no matter how amazing your circumstances are. It is powerful, it's the most powerful tool we have. And when we finally recognize how powerful it is, we can move mountains. <laughs> prayer is powerful and God hears our prayer. Uh, when we pray in accordance with His will, we have every confidence that we, He hears us. And if He hears us, we have every confidence that He will answer what we're asking for. Now, how do you know if you're praying in accordance with His will? Well, you find it in the Bible. Uh, does God say that, that He's going to promise to do this? Does He have specific promises for healing? Does He have specific promises to rescue you? Does he have specific promises that when you, when you pray according to his word, he hears? These are all there. The Bible is a guide for us and a guide to show us the promises. Now, here's something for you. Part of this guide is the names of God. And those names are, are the, the key, if you will, to show us that he is our provider, he is our healer. He is our source. He is our all in all. So right now, let's pray. And if you have a need, realize God is the answer to every human need. It's the reason he set this blueprint in front of us, so that we would have the confidence going to him that we're praying in accordance to, with his will. We don't have to bargain with him. We just have to realize that we can trust him to provide that need. Let's pray. Lord God, we lift the needs of the audience to you and we just declare with thanksgiving that you are the answer to every human need. So for those who need healing, 
we lift them up to you because you have declared to us that you are the Lord God who heals our disease. For those that need provision, you're our provider. For those that need reconciliation, you're the reconciler. You bring all things together in you. We receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Here's a word from Romans. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.